Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity for us to come together. Thank you for the light that's been shining upon us through the ages and especially for the blessings that we have with the understanding and methodology that we use currently. We ask that as we continue to review and grapple and grasp these concepts and ideas, that we grow to understand the character of God, that we discard everything that is that is not the true image of of you, our, our Saviour. And we ask for your guidance and direction as we do this to use methodology correctly uh, in these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, welcome, everyone. One of our, our duties that we have as individuals within this movement is to identify a thread uh, through a presentation or another way of saying it is a is a theme that runs through a presentation and particularly through elder Paminder's presentations so not just a a thread from a particular series but also a thread from older studies so this is if i draw this box here on the board this is a presentation from let's say it's from may uh, 2020 and then we we get down to the our present day let's say it is September of 2024 where we're looking for threads that run through these presentations this was sometimes drawn in this manner Elder Tess drew it like this and she would, she would say that we need to to thread the information of the themes that run through, through presentations, and through studies and through histories. So this is nothing new for us, but this is one of our jobs or roles that we, we can do. But one of the presentations or the the presentations that I'm going to look at today, are from one series. Um, and I'm just drawing them all as a series, and we're looking at a theme that that I believe we can see that runs through each of these presentations through one particular series that Elder Pumindra has done. So uh, I'm reviewing presentations from Slovakia, uh, which is maybe about a month ago now, I think. There are 13 presentations, and I'm not going to focus on reviewing one specific study, but I wanted to take a, a broad bird's eye view of the subjects and the titles to identify a thread or threads running through the series that was prevent, uh, presented in Slovakia. Uh, so to start with, you may be aware that Elder Paminda travels to to different locations to present. And when he before he gets there or when he gets there, he asks questions of the people. So he'll if he's say coming to Australia, he will ask, write down all your questions and send them through to me so that I can answer them. And it helps him to be able to gauge where individuals are at. Also to see a theme that is running through our questions. If there's multiple questions asked in different ways, he's very good at identifying themes that run through these, these questions. And so he's able to address a, an issue. And so since the fall of humanity, God has wanted and has strived to repair the relationships between humans and themselves. Um, every one of us has had of friendships or relationships that have either broken down or, or ended or had real tension between ourselves and and our friend. And while this breakdown in the relationship is present or current, life can be pretty miserable. And every, everyone has experienced that. That's not uncommon. 
Uh, sometimes what we don't think about is that God feels that pain as well, that breakdown in a relationship between humanity and themselves. Unfortunately, what humanity has also done through through all the generations is to add so much uh, disinformation and misinformation about God that when we picture God and their character, it's so distorted from the truth that we, we get a, a completely different picture that is nothing what God actually, God's character actually is. So I'm, I'm going to state from the beginning uh, that this series from Elder Parminda to me, I can see, is addressing the character of God. Um, and it looks at the traps and the snares that we've fallen into that have given us a wrong understanding of God, but also importantly, the methodology and the concepts that help to uncover that veil so that we can see that true character of God. Uh, so just on the board behind me, I'll, I'll draw a box and that box will depict a study from Slovakia and we'll just go through them in order and and look at the title and and some of the information about the study that was provided and see the theme that's running through them so this is study one so I'll just draw a number one up there and the presentation was called equal to god So uh, prior to, to this presentation, Parminda asked the questions of, of the people there. And one of the first questions he starts with is, why was Adam created first? So we get the context of where the question is. We see the creation of Adam and Eve, and we see where it's taken place in the Garden of Eden. Um, it moves on to how they were created uh, out of the earth and from the rib, and why was why was there that differentiation between Adam and Eve? And then goes on to look at can we be equal with God? What does that look like? So, equal to God talks about a relationship to God our relationship and how we begin to grow and mature, how God views us and how God is looking forward to and wanting to share power with humans, humanity, because as an end result, that will enhance, uh, strengthen, it will, it will grow and test that right relationship between God and humans. So, what we start to see is a reframing of our interpretation of what God is wanting from this relationship with humans. How are they affected by it? What do they get from it? Um, at this point, I'll just say, if anyone has any questions or thoughts, uh, you are welcome to unmute and, and ask questions or, or add thoughts as we move along. So in this box, I'm just going to write down a, a general overview of what I think the study helps to point, point out. In the second study, second presentations, we've got the essence of equality as a title. So study two.
So if you look at a definition of equality in the dictionary, you're going to get multiple definitions. And what this starts to point out is that this movement creates and uses definitions and concepts that specifically target uh, the essence or the crux of, it, of an issue, the, the foundation of the issue. What is that core point that we are getting to with this definition of the essence of equality? And often you'll find that that definition used by our movement is not taught by the world. It's not taught by churches or, or other organisations. It's a, a definition unique to this movement. Um, and that shouldn't be uh, new or controversial for any of us, because this has happened lots of times before. Um, a, a really simple one would be uh, Elder Tess gave us a definition of the essence of right wing, which is this idea of um, individual freedom over rule, ruling in favour of over uh, equality for people and the left wing being the opposite. The left wing will have a focus in their in their thoughts, in their understanding that equality is greater than the individual need of a few. So that's that's a concept that starts to run through these presentations yeah. is how is our information formed? Or obtained. I'm going to skip Val uh, presentation three because it was on Val twenty four and and it doesn't really fit into to what I'm doing here today. The next one we'll go to is a combined combined group of studies. Uh, I'll look at presentation four, five, and six together. And, and bring these in because they're talking about the presentation title for number four was a vow, vow 17, a question on diet. Uh, question five is eat and diet. And presentation six was uh, after sin, what happened? Or after sin, what changed? So these these three presentations in particular behind me, presentation four, five, and six from Elder Parmindra are really packed filled with with information. Um, you could you could go on for a long time with these. And you may recall Brendan about two weeks ago started to review these studies. And I want to say that uh, from this point of view that at a face value, it may look like it's talking about, diet and we can see or we're looking at an understanding where we get our ideas from our our information of diet so we have a an idea of eden to eden diet and what begins to be broken down within those studies is Eden to Eden diet is not a biblical concept. It is a strictly Adventist principle. 
And so it's understanding how we get that information that we've already got, uh, how we came across it, and then reviewing it. Um, because so many of the studies that we have with the methodology, methodology gives answers that seem contrary to many of our, our previous understandings. And, and we know early Adventism didn't get everything correct. So we, we start to see a, a bit of a theme. We're looking at our relationship to God, what that can look like, we're looking at how our information is obtained. And then this is this is really a continuation of those same thoughts that that take place during this period. Um, I will link link these two together. You're going to see repeating a repeating pattern or repeating concepts take place over and over again. And that's because it's it's hard for us to grapple with ideas and concepts that we have already understood from inspiration. Whether it's the Bible or whether it's the spirit of prophecy, we get an idea in our head because we read something from Alan White or the Bible, and then we get some information through parable methodology that seems to be uh, contrary to what has been taught. So it's understanding this information, how we get it, where it came from, how it was explored, and, and then how we deal with that information. Um, I think I can do it. Yeah. So presentation seven. It's called an exercise in methodology. Um, again, looking at the information obtained and then how we apply the methodology throughout these, these studies. So What's mentioned here is our religious education that is required for us to be able to discuss the topics that arise during our elder Paminder studies. Um, so woven through William Miller's 14 rules is an overarching principle that you need to apply for each rule. And Paminder tells us uh, and that that is faith. So pres presentation seven is called an exercise in methodology. And William Miller has 14 rules. Those 14 rules, woven throughout those 14 rules, is this principle, and this principle that you need is faith. And Elder Paminder goes on to break down what that faith is. Um, the rules don't work without faith. The way faith was described was a, a comprehensive understanding of the inner workings of God's brain. And you get that through, and he lists, he lists multiple, uh, multiple books through Ellen White, the Bible, um, the Conflict of the Ages series. Uh, great controversy, early writings, and something else. So in order for us to use these 14 rules, in order for us to see where our understanding has come from from these studies that, that have been done, where our information is obtained from, 
we have to have this grounding in information that has come, what we call inspiration, Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Without that it, grounding of information, we're unable to have a conversation about it. If you didn't know anything about mathematics and you went to try and have a conversation about maths, you couldn't join in. You wouldn't understand. You wouldn't comprehend. The same is for our studies within the movement. Before you can even start to apply methodology, you need to know and understand the inner workings, as, as Elder Paminda put it, inner workings of God's brain. That is described to us through the, the Bible and spirit of prophecy. <laughs> then what happens is we work through this methodology and this methodology is going to bring understandings of what has been taught in in the Bible and spirit of prophecy and then the contradictions that we might have or seem to have with our studies when we use parable methodology for ourselves. I'll move on to the next one. Number eight. This is called joining hands with the world. So this again focuses on the idea that uh, diet is is not a Adventist uh, it is a, is particularly uh, not a biblical issue, but an Adventist phenomenon, and it looks at the history of how Adventism came to understand about the the issue of diet and then the repeating pattern that we have for us today uh, associated with politics. So again, you're seeing these same principles spoken about over and over again. Um, our, our relationship to God, how we gain that information and then how to exercise methodology, how you need a, an understanding in inspiration, and then repeating this, the same topics um, again, because it's hard for us to, to retrain the mind once it's been taught in a particular way. Presentation nine. This is called, Why Do You Punish the Innocent? Um, so just by way of clarification, I haven't drawn out it every single point that Elder Parminder talks about through these individual studies. I am taking just the points that I want to highlight and and spread out, depicted on this board as what I think are, are key points that are recurring throughout the presentations. So presentation nine, why punish the innocent? Why do you punish the innocent? And this is how we view God, how you and I view God. The way you read inspiration affects the way you visualize and relate to God. And the way it was, the way inspiration was written also affects it. So do you view God as a being who is going to kill you? Or do you view God as a being that's doing everything they can to reconcile with you? to repair that relationship that was damaged. 
So within this thought, there's this very real tension between two ideas that takes place uh, at the same time. And this in particular is where parables and parable teaching really shines. Um, I'll wipe off this corner up here. Parable teaching does many things for us. One of the things that it does is it keeps us out of trouble and keeps us on track. So to point that out, uh, and I think why Christ taught with parables as well as why we use them, is, is juxtapositioning. Just with juxtapositioning alone, I'm going to put a J because I can't, I won't remember how to spell juxtaposition. Juxtaposition. That's probably wrong, but you understand what I mean. Juxtaposition. This is the this is the concept you want to know. And if we we use the the idea that was given in in presentations four, five, and six, uh, Elder Paminda said, we want to know about the human body. What happened after sin? And we understand juxtapositioning or we're learning that in order to find out what happened here, we bring two things into conflict. We bring over something that has nothing to do with what we, nothing to do with conceptually with what we're doing. We're looking at a plant here. And this plant comes into tension. So between these things here, there, there is this tension. Because they don't naturally go together. We're not looking for something that's similar. Part of the rules is we're not looking for something similar. We're looking for something that's different. And that's where the power of, of juxtapositioning shines and why part of the reason why I think we use juxtapositioning is because it helps to get rid of or alleviate or, or reduce the chance of uh, confirmation bias. Um, I'll write it as CB, confirmation bias. So we want to know about the human body, what happened after sin? We went to a plant, something completely different, which is what juxtapositioning is, bringing two things together that are very different. You look at this one to tell you more about this one. When you look at this, this becomes your first witness. This is the planet. The first witness to tell you a story of the body of humans after sin. And because you've gone to something completely different, you reduce the chance of falling into the trap of confirmation bias. So the definition of confirmation bias is a tendency to search for, to interpret or to favor and recall information in a way that confirms or supports your prior beliefs or values. So we've got an idea of what sin does to us here because we've read inspiration, we've read the Bible, we've read Conflict of the Ages series. So we have some thoughts that are already in our mind. If we were to go and look at another passage or another piece of writing, it would 
quite possibly or with an increased chance confirm some of the information that we already know. And so this is what the modeling of juxtapositioning does. Gets you away from a, a model or that model, away from that idea and those thoughts that you have to create a, a new model. People, this is going back to the definition of, of confirmation bias. People display this bias when they select information that supports their views. Part of the trouble with confirmation bias is very subtle. You don't know that you're doing it. It's it's a chain a chain reaction, and it is is very hard to pull yourself up on it and to even see that it's happening. So people display the bias when they select information that supports their views, ignoring contrary information. So what we're seeing here is contrary information. We're bringing two things together that don't belong and it's providing contrary information. And that's important. Or when they interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting their existing attitudes. Uh, the effect is strongest for desired outcomes, for emotionally charged issues and for deeply entrenched beliefs. So this is deeply entrenched beliefs that we're dealing with. Uh, also emotionally charged. So we've got these two really strong belief systems and emotionally charged issues of belief around our God and what God is and looks like. And so it, as you'll see through the presentations, um, talking about food, there is, there is that tension there. We get an idea in our mind and we want to stand for it which is not a bad thing to stand for what we believe. But when we're showed contrary information or, or different evidence, then if we're still a, a stick in the mud, as it said, then that will cause us troubles down the line. So one of these particular so i was brought that up and why punish the innocent and one of those example is is this tension this tension that you see in between these two fields uh is god killing people and god restoring humanity and so the these concepts uh need to be viewed carefully uh, I'll move on to number 10. Number 10. Number 10 is who is to blame? So two people to blame, you, two, two beings to blame, humans, humanity, or God. And it comes back to our relationship to God, how we view God. God created people with free will and a desire to have a relationship with that being that is willing and wanting to know and understand God and who they are. So this, this shows this restriction that God has uh, compared to with what we will understand in, in most of um, inspiration, the Bible and spirit of prophecy, is that it will tell you that God is all-powerful. We're saying God is limited. So again, these two ideas or concepts are in tension with each other. The next, the next couple are, I won't go into them too much. 11. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, Eleven and twelve will be the last two that we look at. Perfect people. Imperfect environment. And tw uh, twelve is it says the nature of God revisited. Um, so, presentation 11, perfect people, imperfect environment. We talked about the presentations that Brendan started to cover a couple of weeks ago. There's lots of information in them. Uh, presentation 4, 5, and 6. They talk about the, the impact that the environment had on the people. What was the state of the people? Were they perfect? Were they imperfect? What was the environment like? And this transition, how that affected people. So presentation 11 was a repeat of presentation 4, 5, and 6. It just had some slightly different information and it asked questions in a different way. And what's interesting to note throughout those presentations is that the answers that people started to get in presentation three, four, five, and six, they got wrong in presentation 11. It was asking exactly the same questions, just using different words. And again, it's that challenge that we face of understanding the information that we're giving and, and how that impacts us as individuals. So we need to go over it more than once to understand it. And we need to, the, the mind needs to recreate the neurological pathways that allow us to understand that information and retrieve that information. So we, we often resort back to our old ways as soon as we have a new a question phrased in a new way. And number 12, wraps up what I think is, is one of the core themes running through this series in Slovakia, that the it's looking at the nature of God, it's looking at our relationship with God, and then how how we receive that information to form that relationship, how we have placed a we have placed the veil covering the character of God by the information that we've received that has created that veil. And this is a systematic way to, to get rid of that veil. So we're seeing that the exercising of, of methodology, the faith, the understanding of how we acquire the knowledge and how we view God. And so I guess that is the summary points. These studies look at the character of God. And piece by piece, they take away that veil that, that we have created in our own minds. A veil exists in our own minds, depending on our level of, of understanding as to how obscure that image of the character of God is. They, these studies show the tension Uh, that is required 
LO Cipher methodology. The tension that exists. They they show the limited options and constraints of God. So highlights uh How am I going to write that? Highlights. Restraints of God. Challenges where we get our information from. Source. Um, and to to highlight how that that character of God has been obscured in in our understanding, and these these wrong ideas really do damage us. And our our relationship with God. They show the working of the tools uh, of methodology that are used to unveil the true character of God in our minds. So when we're looking at um, particularly any study, you are able to draw these points out. So if we look at Elder Terry's study uh, on the Sunday Law recently, if you go into it, you're going to see, if you look hard enough, you're going to see this, these same concepts. But the idea of reviewing each of the presentations just at a very broad overview level, I thought it was it was able to be seen very clearly the repeating patterns that were taking place of of Elder Paminda breaking down these thoughts and ideas within us and and depicting it on a board just in in big squares so it's easier to grasp because when you're going through the presentation sometimes it's moving from presentation one to presentation two you're following on with the thought that's being taught. Let's say it is uh, over here. I had presentation four, five, and six, and you're 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 discussing food. And sometimes it's good to step back and and look at that overall principle with being taught throughout that series. Um, so. With that, that is what I wanted to share with everyone today. I will close in prayer and then hand it back to our host. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to come together. Thank you for the technology that we have. We want to understand you better, Lord. We ask for your guidance and direction that we may apply methodology correctly, that we may learn through good information, through parable methodology, how to correctly see you, how to understand you. We ask for a special blessing on this Sabbath as we watch more presentations, as we review what Elder Paminda has done, we ask for your guidance and direction to understand and comprehend that that veil of you may be taken away, that we may understand that character of God and reflect that character. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.